All right, we'll do an update video here. Uh, I got my boxcar and hobo off eBay yesterday. It's got a little hobo in it and everything. I'm going to have to hot glue him in, I guess. He just sits in there. That's just to keep him from falling out. But it's got steel wheels, axles on it. It's G scale, garden scale. I'm not sure, I haven't looked that up, if that really is a company or not. I'm gonna have to Google that and see if it's But for 17 bucks, I won the, I put max bet at, at 30 bucks, but it never went that high, so uh, I think it's pretty neat. Uh, anyway, uh, I had, uh, last week I had a bunch of labs done at the doctor, and a few of those came back last week. And tomorrow I go in again and uh, have the rest of my labs presented to me with the results. So I'm going to find out what the next step is. But I'm just chilling here for now until I get this medical stuff out of the way. You know, a lot of people ask me, like, how is it now compared to the way it was? When I started riding, uh, you kind of have the same bracket of people. Like back when I started riding, you had a more, there was more respect, it seemed. And then, uh, of course, you had less riders. You didn't have as many as you do now. That's like with everything in life. As time goes on, you just have more of people and you just have to keep expanding but the railroad expands too so as the population expands you have that many more people that are going to take that slot but as changes happen the changes that change towards the bad are more noticeable it seems and the changes that happen towards the good seem to be less noticed and that's, again, that's like everywhere, every walk in life. But, um, and a lot of people ask me, where did I get my food and how did I make money? Well, it was kind of hard at first, that first couple of months until I kind of got the hang of things. And you go every big town with like 40 or 50,000 population or higher has those day laborer jobs uh, you get paid at the end of the day and you might be moving furniture one day or doing lawn uh, doing lawn maintenance the next day or helping somebody move another day and you get paid at the end of the day and uh, you go to a, especially my first second first, second, and third year riding, I went to a lot of food banks and uh, got canned goods here and there, bread, crackers, uh, canned fish. Uh, after a while, it become like a routine, get into town, go work a day labor place for a day or two. I tell you, I think out of all places, Utah, Utah was probably my favorite place as far as day labor. Seems like everywhere you went in Utah, you had a, a day labor organization. And uh, I liked working in Utah because outside in the summer, it really ain't that humid. Well, it gets hot, but uh, just bring you plenty of water on the job. And you always get, you get enough sun in Utah. A lot of people liked Las Vegas working there, but whew, that's just Las Vegas is the last place I think anyone should go. Good Lord. 
Then I've done the apples, apple picking up in Wenatchee, down in that area. Did some onions, uh, some cherries out by the Dalles, um, down around Bend. All that area up there, is, uh, they do a lot of produce, cherries, apples, uh, and a lot of onions, a lot of onions around Pasco, Wishram, uh, not Wishram, uh, Kennewick is what I meant, um, Kent, all up in that Puget Sound area too, there's different kind of work you can do. Some fish cannery work around like Kent in the Puget Sound area, but you want fish cannery work, you kind of got to go up to Alaska for that. And generally, when you get up there in fish cannery, it's not like everybody tells you you're going to go up there and work on a boat and make $20,000 in three months. If you don't have any experience, you work, you'll get minimum wage. And they normally pay your room and board and your food but room and board consists of like eight guys to one room. It's like being in basic training all over again. And of course, working 14, 16 hours a day at those fish canneries, you don't get much lead time. You get like eight hours to wash laundry if you want to do it or get in a little TV. Most people just straight to bed, no shower or nothing. You ain't really got to have a shower. You ain't trying to impress anybody. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where to put this boxcar at. I might have to get a piece of track to go under it. I don't know if they sell individual tracks of it or not. All right, I'm going to do a question and answer from my youtube post i made a post earlier i'm gonna try to do a take take question and answer uh portion here on the video okay uh vamp Fay asked hey shoestring i hope you feel better very soon my question is what's the hardest thing about being unable to travel and stuck at home right now Second part question, what does your family think about your long and notable rail riding career? All right, Elisa, um, I guess the worst part about being stuck and sick is having that, having that feeling that you just want to go. You just absolutely can't retain yourself. You can't keep yourself steady you you have to get up and go you got to go right now but you're unable to because you gotta watch yourself because this past few months getting out and overdoing it man I, I just keep making things worse and as far as my family that second part at first I think they just thought it was a phase and that over time I would eventually give up and not ride anymore and settle down, but it never did happen. After about 15, 20 years of doing it, they really didn't worry anymore because they figured if I'd done it that long, then I must be doing something right, so they quit worrying as much, I believe. Um, yeah, as far as being unable to travel right now, I just... Oh my God, just, that's another reason I can't sleep. I just constantly want to, it's like impulses, constant impulses of wanting to ride and just get my backpack and just take off. But physically, I, I, I can't do that right now. All right, here is, uh, now if I don't get to your question that you've asked on my community page, I'll try to answer it uh, personally uh, underneath where you asked the question. I'm just taking these randomly. Uh, Low Plains Drifter asks, uh, have you ever had trouble with street gangs around major cities like being ran off from hop out 
stuff like that. No, not really. Uh, I've always rode into the yards that are way on the outskirts. Now, there was a couple of times in L.A. when I rode into Los Angeles, I went a little bit too far of that Colton yard. That's near San Bernardino. And I went to a little thrift store to get a couple of things. And when I got out, this group of kids on bikes, they probably weren't but 14, 15, started following me. So I got up about a block and a half in front of them and zigzagged down and went and hid behind a dumpster. And I could hear them ride by, and I was just praying to God. I, I knew what they were up to. But uh, I waited there about three hours behind that dumpster. But as far as that, uh, no, not really. Usually if I get off in a big city, I go straight to the nearest city bus stop and get on a city bus and go to a, a better part of town. All right. We got uh, Long Slong Dong is the name. What is your greatest piece of advice from your many years of experience in life. Uh, I would say the biggest piece of advice is just be glad you are where you're at right now. There's nothing on nothing on earth that's too important than right now. I guess just be glad you're alive and glad you're you're breathing. I've never really thought of that, but that's, that's all I can think of, just to be happy. Here's a Jaybird, two-part question. How long after the railroad took your fingers did it take you to get back riding? Part two. And what was the first ride you took when your hand healed? Thanks. Okay, uh... As soon as I got out of the hospital in Kansas City, three weeks later, I went to Carla's house, as a matter of fact, and I stayed there about a week. And from there, that I caught straight out. Uh, I, I think I caught a grainer, I believe, when I left. And Oh, yeah, I, I went back west coast. I went through Denver, uh, Kansas City, back through Denver. And that was all hands still bandaged up. All right. Let's see. Ningle, Ning, Ningle's World. I believe that's the name. What was your scariest or most awkward train ride? Example, a runaway train, damaged car, derail, etc. Well, I caught out a... El Paso, this was like probably mm, 93, 94, I guess, going westbound towards Tucson in L.A. and Yuma. And I was on the train a good probably, oh, 12, 13 hours. And the train pulls off in the siding. And I'm thinking we're just letting another train go by. Here about four or five hours later, still nothing then I heard the air air break. I heard the chain come apart. They took the head end off, brought it down the main line, brought it back up to the back of the train. And the workers walked by and they brought, brought that Freddy down from the, the tail end and brought it back up to where the front end was and started going back east. I rode all the way back to El Paso and come to find out later, the crew had picked up the wrong train in El Paso. And they didn't find out about it until we took that siding. So they turned the train around and went all the way back to El Paso. So I, I don't know where that train was supposed to have ended up, but it wasn't Tucson. So I rode all the way back. All right, Eric Smith. Ask, hey shoestring, hope you're feeling a little better. When you, when I sent you the Conrail engine and and cars, and you said that Conrail was your favorite, my question is, have you ever hopped when Conrail was around? Get well soon. 
Uh, yeah, matter of fact, Conrail was one of my my favorite railroads, and uh, Elkhart area was my favorite area to ride. Um, they were the easiest to me. Also, they seemed to be the most cleanest, not physically, but just as far as keeping the tracks clean and the yards clean. Conrail, yeah, they was my favorite back then. Uh, when you get to Elkhart, they would always fuel up the run-through trains there in Elkhart right at the fuel docks. And uh, you had everything you needed, a little day labor downtown. South Bend wasn't but 14 miles away. So you had everything you needed in Elkhart. You'd get on and ride to Buffalo or going east or uh, Chicago back west. Um, oh, and by the way, Eric, I got that Conrail engine. Uh, I'll have to show it in a video. Maybe I can squeeze it in this video. I'll show you that Conrail engine. Okay, uh, it says... Oh, this one doesn't have a name, or I, or I don't see the name. Uh, good morning. I'd like to hear a list of... Few of the valuable or very curious items you have ever found along the tracks in your travels. Thanks. Uh, oh, John from Michigan. Well, I, I don't know if it was weird, but one time out in Barstow, California, I was out looking for a place to set up my tent. And I probably go about maybe a mile north of the, rip, the dry river. And I'm just kicking rocks as I'm walking. And I come across this, I don't know, fist-sized chunk of iron. And it looked all... Oh, it's hard to see what kind of shape it was. It looked like sponge, but it weighed a ton. And uh, I took it to a museum. And they they asked me where I got it. And I they didn't have phones back then. I didn't, I didn't have a geotag of where I got it, but, uh, they said a 90% chance it was, a it was an iron meteorite that I had found, that's why they were wanting to know the, I guess, where I found it at, and they asked me, did I see any more, and I said, no, nah, I, I can go back and look, but I never did go back and look, I just let them have it, and never did hear back from them if, if it was a real meteorite, but he said he was 90% sure it was a an iron meteorite. All right. Virginia native asked, just curious, when you traveled to a distant area such as Canada, did you know the destination of the trains and uh, where you wanted to go, or did you just hop and hop on and let it take you wherever? Well, when I first started riding. It was just kind of on a whim. I really didn't know where the trains were going. My first train ride was in Laramie, Wyoming. I I had no idea where the train was going. I was just glad to be on something rolling. That took me to Stockton, California, two and a half, three days later. And it was that way for about seven or eight years. And I finally just learned all the routes. But like when I was in Canada, there's not many railroads up there, rail lines, so you can almost just guess where you're going. If you're going east, just look at the next east town on the map and you're bound to go through it because most of, probably 90% of Canada's population is in that first 300 miles across the border. After you get north, into Canada over 300 miles, most of the population is south of that point. Um, but yeah, I just, and sometimes if I couldn't figure out where to go, I'd just get on, and that would help my mind get made up. And do it yourself, home improvements says, ask, have you ever gotten on a train and seen someone else jump on also? Or have you ever been waiting for a manifest and seen others waiting also oh lord yes especially back when i started riding 
golly, you'd, there'd be seven, eight of us at one camp waiting. Usually half of us were going one way and half were going the other. And the most I ever remember was riding out of Whitefish, Montana, going into Minot, North Dakota. There was 11, 11 of us on. There was like, I think we had three counting me on my box car. Then a car down was two or three, and car down we kind of spread out so we wouldn't all be bunched together. And uh, yeah, that was a uh, the most eleven. But yeah, up until about nineteen ninety five, just about everywhere you went, any town you got off the train at, you'd find another train rider or two or three, and about half of them had dogs. But times back then, they were nice. They'd, they'd see you walking down the tracks and then, hey, Tramp, come on over here. They'd usually have some food hot and ready. Come on, have a beer. Come on, join us. Where are you heading? But that was the good old days. Uh, well, that's as many as I got for right now. Uh, let's see. All right, Eric. Here's that Conrail engine. I, I went up and got it and brought it down here in the light. That's the one you sent me there. I, I got that grainer up there too. Um, and here's probably my favorite thing anybody's ever ever done. It's a railroad spike. And he's carrying a bucket and got a backpack. And he said that string stands for uh, the shoestring. I really like this. I'll, I'll carry this with me for the rest of my life. I guess he cut down the uh, pointy part of the spike and bent it apart to make the legs. But got complete with the bucket and everything. Yeah... Last week, uh, when I got real sick, I had a bunch of labs drawn, and uh, a few of the results came back. Uh, the platelets were a little high, but uh, they were, weren't as high as I thought they were, but the hepatic encephalopathy is what uh, the main thing right now that's got me down. It's just different natural toxins in the bloodstream that you know, usually gotten out and broken down by the liver and sent to the kidneys, it, they just build up because the liver's not functioning right. So, it's uh, hepatic encephalopathy is what they call it. So, I go in tomorrow and have some more labs done to see how that is. But, uh, yeah, somebody had commented that I ought to change my channel name from Hobo Shoestring to Going to the Doctor. So I, I wasn't quite sure if he was being a being an ass or what. But anyway, that's kind of the update of where we stand on that. Uh, so I'll go in tomorrow for some of the other labs, that, the results that didn't come in, I guess had to be sent off like the cultures and stuff but that's where i'm standing now as far as the medical issues going um let me get up here and see if i don't know if that looks even to y'all or not i can't really tell yeah i got some decorations up here so my other shower curtains and I got some stuff up here and there. Yeah, I just want everybody to know uh, I'm trying as hard as I can. There's nothing more than I want than to be outdoors right now. But as far as some more advice, uh, do what the doctor says. Do what your body says. Don't put things off. Of course, I'm still learning that. 50 years and I'm still trying to tackle things that 20 year old can't but 
I'll get through this. I always have gotten through everything. It's just taking a little longer nowadays. Well, I hope everybody liked a different twist on the video this time.